Hello and welcome tonight. Ondo State Commissioner for Health dies of COVID-19 related complications as more state officials are suspected of having tested positive for coronavirus, including the governor's wife. Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 insists federal government will not hesitate to change current COVID-19 pandemic measures as cases continue to rise. They ask Nigerians to seek the face of God. Nigeria Labour Congress condemns increase in petrol pump price from 121 Naira to 143 Naira, asked the federal government to reverse the decision. President Mohamed Uhari orders suspension of Managing Director and Chief Executive of the Nigeria Social Insurance Trust Fund, 11 others over alleged acts of misconduct, and former girlfriend to U.S. sex, late sex offender, Jeffrey Epstein is arrested in New Hampshire. Plus, business and news from Abuja, the FCT, and later from our studios in London. On business news tonight, Federal Inland Revenue Service releases list of business-related transactions captured in the new adhesive stamp duty. A sports news, Pep Guardiola's Manchester City FC thrashing newly crowned Premier League champions Liverpool FC at the Etihad. And from Abuja, federal government holds key stakeholders meeting over proposed electricity tariff increase, insists no kick-off date for new rate. We begin tonight with grim news from Ondo State, where the Commissioner for Health, Dr. Wahab Adigbenro, has died from COVID-19 related complications. Channel Television gathers that Mr. Adigbenro died at the state's infectious disease hospital today, but state officials are yet to confirm the cause of the death. Meanwhile, the Chief Medical Director of the University of Medical Sciences Teaching Hospital in the state, Dr. Uluwalege, has also tested positive for the virus. There are also strong indications tonight that the wife of the state governor, Betty Akeridulu, and some of her aides may have tested positive for COVID-19. This is coming two days after the state governor, Rutimi Akeridulu, tested positive for the virus. The governor has asked cabinet members to go for compulsory tests and self-isolate. In the meantime, from the Federal Capital Territory, the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 says the federal government will not hesitate to change course and reverse some of its decisions as the number of confirmed cases of the virus infections continue to rise. The chairman of the task force, Mr. Boss Mustafa, gave the warning at the daily news briefing by the task force in Abuja. He also asked citizens to seek God's intervention against the virus as he announces plans by the Nigeria Interreligious Council to call for national fasting and prayer against COVID-19. Let me also... The chairman of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, Mr. Boss Mustafa, leads today's briefing, noting the consistent rise in the number of confirmed cases in the country. To thank you for... He informs the gathering that the government will not hesitate to change its decisions, even as he urges citizens to key into a national prayer and fasting program against COVID-19. One significant observation the PTF wishes to make is the new rise in cases are to be expected as nations start to ease restrictions. That is the picture all over the world. We shall, however, proceed with caution and we shall not hesitate to change course when the need arises. The co-chairman of the Nigerian Interreligious Council, NIREC, would be directing Muslims and Christians to go for a period of fasting and prayers. And we urge all Nigerians to participate in this effort to seek for divine intervention in the calamity that is befalling all of humanity. The Minister of Health also explains what the government is doing to reduce the number of COVID-19 related fatalities. The Federal Ministry of Health's plan will therefore be to focus more on minimizing fatalities
by prioritizing preemptive admission to hospital for medical observation, all persons who test positive for COVID-19 and meet our definition of vulnerability. These include the elderly, diabetics, asthmatics, and persons in treatment for chronic infections and conditions. Preliminary results of analysis of the so-called Madagascar herbs or organics done by the Nigeria Institute for Pharmaceutical Research and Development shows that it is the same plant called Artemisia anua, which is grown in nitrate farms in Abuja. Further research on its efficacy will be conducted when the grant for the research is approved. There are over 30 molecular laboratories for testing COVID-19 in Nigeria. Yet the country has barely tested a little above 138,000 samples in five months. There's clearly uh, a lack of demand. Uh, a lot of these laboratories are underutilized. The capacity, their capacity far exceeds what they are getting in terms of samples. Testing, isolation and treatment are both key components of the global response to COVID-19. This is where Nigeria needs to step up, as the 138,462 tests recorded so far is not good enough for a country of an estimated population of 200 million people. Staying with the COVID-19 pandemic, but to the aviation sector, ahead of the commencement of domestic flights in Nigeria, after more than three months of suspension following the outbreak of COVID-19, the Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sarika, says aides of VIPs who are not traveling will not be allowed to enter airports. The minister who is giving these details to members of the Senate Committee on Aviation during an interactive meeting in Abuja says VIPs and politicians who have no business traveling will also be prevented from entering airports when domestic flight operations resume on July the 8th. He adds that the airport authorities are committed to ensuring the provision of necessary safety protocol to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We have circulated this, and Mr. President approved. All those who have no business in traveling will certainly have business to remain within the zones that we allocate. They will not enter our airports, not at all. And the only person that, ha that can carry whoever he wants into the airport is Mr. President. Luckily, he doesn't fly from my airport. He flies from his own. So, so, so he's on his own. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody coming into the airport this, this time around, whether he is uh, chief of this, chief of that, or he is uh, minister this, minister that, or even our august honorable members and distinguished senators, will not be carrying our aids into the airport any longer. We have the airport uh, security program, uh, and that in itself is being pursued diligently as well as the new health uh, program. So both the health and security, which are two burdens, we must make sure that we are safe. We must make sure that we are also healthy too. From aviation to education, there are more reactions to the federal government's planned reopening of schools for graduating classes across the country amidst the rising number of COVID-19 cases. Some stakeholders in the education sector who express concern consider the resumption ill-timed and without adequate preparation, especially for vulnerable students. The federal government disagrees, insisting the reopening is important in order to avoid a negative impact on education in the long run. In March 2020, the federal government ordered a closure of all schools in Nigeria to curb the spread of COVID-19. About three months after, schools' gates remain shut, classrooms and playgrounds are still empty, while state government are tinkering with innovative ideas on how to minimize lost time. And for others, it's an unavoidable dilemma. Experientially, countries that have tried to resume school have had to contend with increased prevalence of the virus. So obviously, how long are we going to wait as a country? But the Minister of State for Education believes some modalities have to be put in place before schools can resume. It's really not a compulsion. Uh, we're just making the facilities available for the purposes of taking 
the exams for those who want to take the exams because there are also people who may not actually want to take the exams uh, but it would not be a, a responsible act by government to then say because there are some people who may not want that we should not make available the facilities for those who may want containing the spread of the virus is a major concern for other stakeholders they argue that the measures provided by the government may not be adequate enough especially for the vulnerable students are we saying that we should open schools without decontaminating the schools for a government that could go openly to decontaminate streets to decontaminate markets add lives in the schools not as valuable as those working on the streets we need to do the basic minimum however the task force insists in order to avoid a significant negative impact on the educational sector the graduating classes should be allowed to return to schools we have a large number of students that are in their exit years. Uh, they need to move on. Uh, we have exams that are not specific only to Nigeria, but uh, throughout West Africa, the WAEC exams, for instance. We need to find a way to safely get these students to do their exams and exit. Otherwise, we'll have a serious spillover effect when it comes to, uh, to education. Although opinions are divided over planned resumption of schools, returning students are expected to adhere to all precautionary measures. And maybe everyone would need to accept that risk is a part of human existence. I'm now being joined on the news at 10 by a policy and analyst and country officer of the Open Society Initiative for West Africa, Mr. Jude Illo. You're welcome to the news at 10. Thank you very much. We understand the misgivings of parents and guardians concerning the reopening of the schools given the contagious nature of this disease. We also understand what the government is saying about how the education calendar has been upended by this pandemic. Where do you stand? Are we ready for reopening of schools, even if it's for graduating students who have pertinent exams? Yeah, I mean, we have to accept, first of all, that you know, we're all tired of staying at home. Uh, we're very much eager to see that life returns back to normal. And naturally, parents, everybody's worried about the school calendar. So there's a genuine concern here and the genuine need to see how we can get the kids back to school. However, uh, if you're gonna get the kids back to school, it has to be based not just on emotion or on a need, but also on clear science and empirical evidence. We have just tested less than 140,000 Nigerians in a country of, of, of more than 150 million people. I do not think honestly that we have enough scientific evidence to base a judgment of this magnitude on. I do not think that having this very limited number of tests, that government gets a clear picture of what the spread of the disease is, what the dangers are, and what best to do under the circumstance. So without this informed, coming from an informed background, I worry about this decision. Then secondly, this is a decision that involves parents, schools, and teachers. I have not seen or read anywhere that the federal government undertook uh, to, uh, 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 to consult with parents. Uh, I've not read that this decision is bottom up. And this is a perennial problem with decision making in, in Nigeria, where we sit somewhere in Abuja and begin to make decisions that affect people who are actually in the field who know better than we do. Without talking to school owners, without talking to teachers, without talking to parents, without talking to psychologists, I don't think the federal government should be talking about resumption of school because this is, a, this is not an informed decision in my view. Then, therefore, what, think, what do you think needs to be done as far as measures the government need to take now that they're going forward with this measure? So one is what's been said repeatedly. We need to really increase the number of testing we are doing so we'll have, we'll have a better picture of the risk and the challenges we are dealing with across the country. Secondly, uh, there are, the federal government is not an island in managing schools. There are other stakeholders. And I think it is important to have a proper conversation and consultation 
uh, with teachers, schools, uh, health officials, and and and, and the rest of uh, the rest of the uh, of of that group, to one understand clearly the risk this presents, and then collectively have a joint understanding of what needs to be done to reduce those risks, and again have a buy-in of the schools and parents, uh, you know, before you go to open schools. Because if you don't do that then this becomes just your decision. You don't get the buying of parents, you don't get the buying of teachers, and at the end of the day, it becomes a disastrous policy. So consultation, 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 in my view, is important yes. at this time to help one for us to have, a, have confidence in this process. That's as far as we can go uh, with those questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Jude Illo. He is the policy analyst and country officer of the Open Society Initiative for West Africa. You're watching the news at 10. Coming up in just a moment, in part two after the break, Nigeria Labour Congress condemns increase in petrol pump price from 121 Naira to 143 Naira, asks federal government to reverse the decision. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos, a reminder of our top stories. Ondo State Commissioner for Health dies of COVID-19 related complications as more state officials are suspected to have tested positive for coronavirus, including the governor's wife. Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 insists federal government will not hesitate to change current COVID-19 pandemic measures as cases continue to rise. They asked Nigerians to seek the face of God. Nigeria Labour Congress condemns increase in petrol pump price from 121 Naira to 143 Naira, asked federal government to reverse the decision. And President Mohamed Buhari orders suspension of managing director and chief executive of the Nigeria Social Insurance Trust Fund and 11 others over alleged acts of misconduct. And former girlfriend to US late sex offender Jeffrey Epstein is arrested in New Hampshire. Our website, channelstv.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV, and Roku. Let's take you back to our lead story on the death of the Commissioner for Health in Nondo State, Dr. Wahaba Adigbenro from COVID-19 related complications. As tributes continue to pour in from state officials, including Governor Rotimi Akiridulu, who describes late Dr. Adegbenro as a reliable colleague and a compatriot. In a statement on his Facebook page, Governor Akiridulu describes him as a great general in the forefront of our battles against COVID-19. I share in your pains and grief at the demise of this great man. This is a shared emotional moment. My heart is with the family, friends. We have all lost a friend. We have lost a colleague. We have lost a gentleman by excellence and a dedicated professional whose commitment to assign responsibility is legendary. Meanwhile, in Kanu, the state government has lifted the lockdown imposed on the state as the number of cases drops. Now, the state government is, however, maintaining the nationwide 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. curfew imposed by the federal government. Governor Abdullahi Ganduje, who was speaking at the state task force briefing, also directed that all markets and motor parks should be opened 
asking residents to go about their business with caution to avoid increasing the current COVID-19 figures in the state. 40 more COVID-19 patients, meanwhile, are now free to go home after testing negative to the coronavirus at the Lagos Isolation Centers. Out of the 40, 17 are female and 23 male. Two foreigners were also discharged from the isolation centers. Lagos State Governor Babajide Somolu says 19 of the patients were discharged from Onikon, 7 from Bagada, 3 from Mainland Infectious Disease Hospital, Yaba, 8 from Agidingbi, and 3 from Luth Isolation Centers. He appeals to residents not to relent in observing the health guidelines to achieve a COVID-19 free Lagos. Also in Lagos, with the lifting of interstate movement banned by the federal government, bus parks are now back to life in the nation's commercial hub, an epicenter of the virus. The lifting of the ban is presenting travelers with opportunities to effect their plans while transport operators return to their daily business. Our correspondent, Daridu, reports. Up, bright and early, set up in good time. That would have been the main travel tips for interstate travelers before now. But with the government's new decision for interstate movement outside the coffee hours, there are a few more boxes to be checked. Wear a face mask, use the hand sanitizer, maintain physical distancing, take other precautionary measures and be ready to pay more. Chipo and Yaba, home to the busiest interstate parks in the country, are already buzzing. And for many of the travelers here, getting the opportunity to embark on their journey for the first time in months without flouting any rule is a relief. I'm so happy because um, I traveled last uh, January and um, I just happened to be cut off because of the uh, lockdown. The transport operators are also excited to be back in business. Right now, uh, the directive is a 50% is a capacity. Even the 50%, we are not getting it now because of um, some people are still scared of uh, the, the pandemic. This is the Jibo Park in Lagos where a lot of transport business operators are located. It's a hub for interstate travel. Now that the federal government has lifted the ban on interstate travel, businesses are coming alive around here. But not without some concerns though. Some of the passengers we spoke to say they're worried about the hike in fares. Anthony arrives at the park. A journey to Port Harcourt had been suspended for a while. Now she's yet to come to terms with more than 50% she has to pay for the trip. There's no money. We are just all the money now. The last is only 2000 naira that is remaining in my pocket. So government should put everything to normal. Government has been rolling out course of action to fight off COVID-19. But with the gradual ease of those measures, despite the growing number of infected persons, it is evident that the battle to save the economy from crumbling is in the midst of the fight against the virus. Dari Ido, Channel Television News. Now, away from the COVID-19 pandemic, the Nigeria Labour Congress has condemned the increase in the pump price of petrol from 121 naira to 143, as announced by the Executive Secretary of the Petroleum Products Price Regulatory Agency, PPPRA. NLC President Ayuba Waba said in a statement that the new hike in pump price of petrol was announced without the approval of the board of the PPPRA, and the Oversight Ministry speaks volumes of the arbitrary nature, arbitrary nature and public contempt of the operations of PPPRA. The NLC wants the federal government to revert to the old price of petrol, especially given the fact that the price of crude oil in the international market has only slightly increased from the previous price before the downward review was announced two months ago. Negotiations have started over the proposed electricity tariff review as the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, has met with senior members of government and lawmakers to chart a way that will be beneficial to all parties. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Femi Gbadabiamila, 
told journalists after the meeting that the increase will be more on the top echelon in the country and not the general public. He maintains that whenever the tariff increase happens after all parties have agreed and met with the requirements, the sector will witness a shift from the old ways. Top echelon, so to speak, for one of a better way to put it, of the society, perhaps I think 15% of the society, um, that the increase speaks to, not the general 80-85% of the rest of the country. So in effect, a system whereby that 15-20% will be subsidizing the rest of the 80%. So whenever it happens, I need to make this point, whenever it happens, the assurances that we have been given is that it's not a general increase for, the, for all of Nigeria. It's only for, for people like you, highbrow, rich, wealthy, affluent people like you. Everybody's on the same page, even in Nigeria, amongst Nigerians, that um, there has to be cost-reflective tariff because nobody runs any business as a lot, at a loss. The question is when and how. And President Mohamed Buhari has announced the indefinite suspension of the managing director and chief executive of the Nigeria Social Insurance Trust Fund, Mr. Adebayo Shomefu. The Ministry of Labor and Employment said in a statement that 11 other officials in the state, in the NSITF rather, were also asked to proceed on suspension. The statement adds that their suspension was due to the established prima facie infractions of the Financial Regulations and Procurement Act and other acts of gross misconduct. Now, at least nine oil workers with ADEX FPSO have been abducted by sea pirates who attacked the barge OML-126 off Boni in River State. Channels Television gathers that the barge ship was undergoing maintenance when the attack occurred. Now, the vessel, a floating production storage and offloading vessel, FPSO that can produce about 50,000 barrels per, per, of oil per day was working at the Okori oil field operated by Adex Petroleum as part of China's Sinopec Group. Authorities are yet to confirm the extent of damage on the vessel while reports are ongoing to rescue those abducted. The Dubai-based suspected internet fraudster Raymond Igbalode, a bass popularly known as Hush Puppy, may have been extradited to the United States. This is contained in a statement released by the Dubai police in which the director of the U.S. Federal Bureau of, of Investigation, FBI, Christopher Wray, is quoted as co commending the exceptional efforts of the United Arab Emirates in combating transnational organized cybercrime and the arrest of Hush Puppy. Mr. Ray also extended his appreciation to the Dubai police for their cooperation in extraditing Hush Puppy, as well as one Alali Khan Jacob Bonley, also known as Woodbury, who is wanted for multiple cybercrime and money laundering. Last week, the Dubai police released a video showing details of how the arrest of Hush Puppy was effected. The Dubai Interpol had earlier apprehended the suspected fraudster in his residence in the UAE. The Independent Broadcasters Association of Nigeria is asking the National Broadcasting Commission, NBC, to suspend the implementation of the amended 8th Broadcasting, that is 6th Broadcasting Code. The Association Secretary, Mr. Guy Murray Bruce, says the amendment should be subjected to a new round of wide stakeholder consultation to avoid the legal crisis. He explains that the committee in charge of the amendment did not circulate a draft of its work to stakeholder groups before its ratification. Mr. Murray Bruce also explains that IBAN wished to make a few observations which include but not limits to the need for IBAN to have a seat on the committee. The timing of the release of the amendments in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic fears may hamper the ability of the group to internally consult and express its views. The amendments do not reflect the core issues highlighted by the minister in his terms of reference, which centers on licensing of web TV, recruitment of monitoring staff, and allied issues. The group also has reservations as to the practicality of implementing the amendments in their present form and wants the NBC to hold off on the implementation of the amendments at this time. You're watching the news at 10. Coming up,
in a moment. Federal Inland Revenue Service releases list of business-related transactions captured in the new adhesive stamp duty. That will be on Business News. Please join us again. Now for more studios, uh, sorry, for more stories, we join uh, Abuja Studios with Ibrahim Aja. Hello, Ibrahim. Hello, Limited. Thanks for joining us. President Mohamed Buhari has sworn into office 45 commissioners and one chairman into the Federal Character Commission, the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission, as well as the Federal Civil Service Commission. 37 commissioners and one chairman were sworn into the Federal Character Commission. Commissioners were, and then six other commissioners, that is, were sworn into the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission, and two commissioners sworn into the Federal Civil Service Commission. Basically, uh, they have uh, some constitutional responsibilities because all these commissions, uh, the commissions that I mentioned in the Constitution of uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, so that presupposes that already the Constitution has provided uh, for them a mandate. But more especially as we are marching towards the end of the tenure of uh, President Muhammad Buhari, we have just spent a year, we still have three years. But there are so many things that we want them to begin to do in terms of uh, re-energizing the system. The Federal Character Commission particularly has responsibilities in the Constitution, as a, which is very, very fundamental to ensure equitable distribution of not only offices, but even of amenities and, and, and benefits and welfare to the people of the country. The revenue mobilization, it's very critical. Uh, particularly now that we have uh, very serious shortfalls in our earnings. Uh, and the essence of the revenue mobilization was to look at the non-oil sector, particularly in terms of mobilizing revenue for the country. And I believe that they will, now that they have uh, virtually the full complement of their membership, they should be able to give it the necessary drive. And the Federal Civil Service Commission is an institution uh, that uh, has a responsibility of looking at the federal civil service in terms of uh, employment, in terms of uh, promotions, in terms of capacity building. Uh, we need a new federal civil service to take us to the next level. And staying with appointments, the president also approved the reappointment of 12 non-career ambassadors today. The appointment comes barely 24 hours after he asked the Senate to confirm four to a non-career and one career ambassadorial nominees. The president is assuring Nigerians of fairness in representation and inclusiveness in all matters of governance. He explains that the renewal of the appointments follows a performance evaluation which necessitated an approval for continuation in office of the ambassadors. The Office of the Auditor General of the Federation is accusing the Nigerian Law School of violating its extant act and financial regulations. The Auditor General's financial report for 2015, which was submitted to the Senate Committee on Public Accounts for investigation, is querying the management of the law school of spending without proper procedure. Our correspondent Linda Kibi reports. The Senate Public Accounts Committee is holding a meeting with the Nigerian Law School to examine queries raised by the Auditor General of the Federation in its 2015 report. The Auditor General's report questions the Nigerian Law School over the payment of 32 million naira to an unnamed cleaner over a period of 12 months outside budgetary provisions. I think the correct position is that each of the vouchers there should be the first name and order. And at no point in time was the money paid to an individual. The mandate contains the names of all the recipients with the account details. No provision was made in overhead. No provision was made in personnel. No provision was made in capital. So your entire directed revenue, that was said there, that's where you raise the money from. Because it was not appropriate, it was not visible in the budget for that year for you. 
The report also queries the payment of another 36 million naira as dressing allowance through the account of one of the staff for 52 others, also outside monetary provisions. The management of the school will not substantiate these payments with any approval from Salaries and Wages Commission to enable the audit team to determine the genuineness of these payments to staff. I can't imagine lost to pay that two million in someone's account from the other mothers. It can never happen. The management of a Nigerian law school is asked to bring supporting documents to show they spent within budgets. But the Senate sustains the queries raised in the Auditor General's reports. The report also discloses that the Nigerian law school at various times used pension funds to offset other expenses not related to payment of pensions. Visit of the chairman to Nigerian law school, you use pension funds. 401,200. Why will you use pension to when the chairman visits or the other one? You know? To entertain a BOT member. The defense of the director general of the Nigerian law school was not strong enough for the Senate panel to vacate the query. The management of the law school is asked to provide supporting documents to show they adhered to financial regulations, failing which the pension funds under contention will be returned to the institution's pension account. Linda Kibi, Channels Television News. Many thanks indeed, Linda. Now, in another development, the three Adama state senators in the National Assembly have visited the Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Babatunde Fashala, in appreciation of the recent approval of the reconstruction of Jabi Lamba Bellet Road, which has been abandoned for 47 years. The three lawmakers, led by Senator representing Adama Central, Senator Aisha to Ahmed Binani, thanked the minister for the ongoing construction of Mayabelo Tungu Road. Senator Ahmed Binani said a request for the construction of other roads has been submitted to the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing. It's a thank you visit to the Minister of Works by the three senators from Adamawa State. The senators led by Senator Aisha to Dahiru Ahmed are full of gratitude for the recent approval of the reconstruction of the Jabi Lamba Belel Road. We are here on behalf of the good people of the state to say a very big thank you for the recently approved contract for the reconstruction of Jabilamba Belel Road that was left unattended for 47 years and for the progress of works on Mayobalwa Jadaganye Tongo Road, which you graciously flagged up in the fourth quarter of 2018. Your Excellency, Honorable Ministers, we say a very big thank you. We really, really appreciate and we are extending the appreciation of our constituents. However, the lawmakers are asking for more. They are appealing for construction of more roads and other infrastructure in the state. We are asking for more attention on the quick completion of many federal government roads projects that have remained uncompleted for several years. Example like the Chamnuma Jalingo Road. And at the same time, plead, request, and beg you to consider many other federal roads and bridges that are almost collapsing. For example, the Mararaba Fufore Sebore Karlahi Mayo Chanchi, for which a request has been submitted to your office. Along with others which we will induce provide to your office across the whole state. For the minister, the lack of resources has been a challenge in the completion of existing road projects and other infrastructure across the country. The biggest problem we have today is the resources to complete most of the roads that we inherited from the previous administration that we are continuing with. I commend you for this initiative and I hope that it will lead us further in the quest to solve the problems. For 47 years, the Jabi Lamba Belel Road in Adamawa State has been unmotorable. However, last month the Federal Executive Council approved the reconstruction of the road. The Adamawa Senators hope that more of such approvals will be extended to other federal roads in the state. Thank you for your company. Business News is next with Anne Mwawodo in our Lagos studio. Thank you, Ibrahim. Welcome to Business News. Nigerians will have to pay stamp duty on rent or lease agreements, certificate of occupancy for properties, as well as other common business-related transactions. That's according to the Federal Inland Revenue Service. 
In a statement released today, the FIRS says the chargeable transaction under the Stamp Duties Act is reflective of the Finance Act 2019. The statement explains the chargeable transactions and fixed duty instrument includes power of attorney, certificate of occupancy, proxy form, appointment of receiver, memorandum of understanding, joint venture agreement, guarantors form and ordinary agreement receipts. While the ad valorem instruments chargeable transactions include deed of assignment, sales agreement, legal mortgage or debentures, tenancy or lease agreement, insurance policy, contract agreement, vending agreement, promissory notes, charter party and contract notes. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation has reacted to reports of a vandalized point of its pipeline at the Aboru Canal in Alimosho, local government area of Lagos State. It says the pipeline contains only water. According to a statement by the corporation today, the pipeline in question has been shut down for repairs and the public should discountenance any report of a possible fire outbreak. The statement also adds that the Atlas Cove Mossimi stretch of a System 2B pipeline was shut down on June the 25th to enable comprehensive maintenance of some segments of that pipeline. It also explains that repair work, which is at a completion stage, involves pumping water through the pipeline for integrity test and leak detection. Let's head to the local equities market now. The main index reversed yesterday's gains on the second half of this year, dropping 0.09% due to profit taking by investors and, of course, portfolio repositioning ahead of second quarter earnings. Let's hear the details from Temple Ashaju. <laughs> Thank you for joining us again on the Stock Market Report. Stocks resumed bearish outing today after sell-offs persisted on banking and consumer goods companies. Now, the overall market picture today was down by some 0.90% to 24,374.40 after a decline of 115 billion naira in the equity capitalization. Now, in the absence of a major catalyst in the market, investors are beginning to reduce their holdings in the likes of UBA, FBN Holdings and GT Bank, a major situation that led to the depreciation in their sectoral performance for the day. Other sectors were not spared as none of the market segments closed in green. But due to COVID-19 pandemic in the system, smart investors are continuing to make profit from healthcare companies like GSK, which was relieved of some gains today, and of course, name it pharmaceuticals that returned some 10% gains at the close of the trading session. And that's the stock market report for today. I'm Tempula Shaju. Well, that's business news tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues with Ulumi Day. Thank you, Anne. Still ahead on the news at 10, former girlfriend to late U.S. sex offender Jeffrey Epstein is arrested in New Hampshire. Plus, more stories from our London studio with Around the World in 5. Please stay with us. Welcome back to politics. Members of the caretaker committee of the All Progressives Congress, APC, have met with national leader of the party, Ashuaju Balatinumbu, at his residence in the Koyi area of Lagos. The committee is led by Yobe State Governor, May Malabuni, and chairman of the Progressive Governors Forum, Abubakar Atiku Baguru. Others at the closed door meeting include Secretary of the Caretaker Committee of the APC and APC Campaign Committee for Edo election, as well as Lagos State Governor, Babajide Somolu. Former girlfriend and longtime associate of the late disgraced financier, Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, was today arrested in Bradford, New Hampshire on U.S. charges of luring underage girls so Epstein could sexually abuse them. Here's Simon Pusey with more international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. 
China has said that Britain would bear all consequences for any move it took to offer Hong Kong citizens a path to settlement in the UK without specifying what countermeasures Beijing might take. The announcement comes after British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said that China's imposition of a security law on Hong Kong was a clear and serious violation of the 1984 Joint Declaration and that Britain would offer around three million residents of the former colony a path to British citizenship. China has also urged Australia to stop interfering in its internal affairs after Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison signalled his government may follow Britain in offering visas to Hong Kong citizens in light of the new law. The law is a brutal, sweeping crackdown. Meanwhile, the U.S. House of Representatives has approved new Hong Kong-related sanctions. The measure, which has passed unanimously, penalizes banks that do business with Chinese officials. It will have to be approved by the Senate before going to President Trump. In Russia, nearly 78% of voters have approved constitutional changes allowing President Vladimir Putin to run for two more six-year terms after his current one ends in 2024. Public opinion on the constitutional vote remains divided, with some praising the leader and others doubting the results of the vote. Putin has said the results are a testament to public trust in him. But critics have said the vote was flawed by serious irregularities, which authorities have denied. A landslide at a jade mine in northern Myanmar has killed at least 113 people, with more feared dead after a pile of mine waste collapsed into a lake, triggering a wave of mud that buried many workers. <laughs> this footage shows body bags lined up as people waited to identify the dead. Deadly landslides and other accidents are common in the country's poorly regulated mines, where many people have been killed in recent years. The popular Ethiopian singer Hakalu Hundisa has been laid to rest in a church in his hometown of Ambo on Thursday as protests sparked by his killing on Monday killed 80 people. <laughs> Mourners by the burial site were seen crying and singing as the coffin was lowered into the ground. Crowds had previously gathered in Ambo Stadium about 100 kilometers west of Addis to follow the funeral procession. Hundisa was shot dead in the capital Addis Ababa on Monday by unknown gunmen. Uganda has offered a safe haven to thousands of people fleeing escalating violence in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Refugees have been stranded in an inaccessible area since May, unable to cross due to a COVID-19 lockdown restricting movement in and out of Uganda. Following reports of thousands of people being stranded between the two countries, the Ugandan parliament agreed to temporarily open two border crossing points on humanitarian grounds so people could access life-saving assistance. In Mexico, gunmen have killed 24 people at a drug rehabilitation facility in the central city of Irapuato, underlining the government's challenge in fulfilling its pledge to stop gang violence. Local police have said the unidentified attack has also shot and wounded seven people in what was the second attack at an Irapuato rehab center in the past month. Meanwhile, Colombia and the United States have seized over seven and a half tons of cocaine worth $286 million in a joint operation which is the largest seizure made in the country since the start of the pandemic. The narcotics were mixed with a construction product and were being transported between the Colombian port city of Cartagena and Panama. Despite decades of anti-drug efforts, Colombia remains one of the world's top cocaine producers. Turkey's top court has convened to consider whether Istanbul's emblematic landmark and former church, Hagia Sophia, can be redesignated as a mosque, a ruling which could inflame tensions with the West. Many Turks have argued that the mosque status would better reflect the identity of Turkey as an overwhelmingly Muslim country, and recent polls have shown that most Turks support a change. But the US and Greece have urged Turkey to keep Hagia Sophia as a museum, while the spiritual head of the world's Orthodox Christians has warned its conversion to a mosque would cause divisions. And finally, an airport in Taiwan has developed a fake itinerary where travel-starved passengers check in, go through passport control and security, and even board the aircraft. They just never take off. Around 7,000 people have applied to take part in the fake flight experience, with the winners chosen at random. The initiative was set up for people craving travel, and also as an opportunity for Songshan Airport to show off renovations. More fake flight events will take place in the coming weeks. That's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos.
Welcome, we begin with the English Premier League where Manchester City FC gave Liverpool a guard of honour and then proceeded to thrash the newly crowned champions by four goals to nil at the 80 had. Ex-Liverpool star Raheem Sterling, alongside with teammates Kevin De Bruyne and Phil Foden, ran riot at Liverpool, causing them great discomfort in the game eventually. Elsewhere, Tottenham's hopes of finishing in the top four is hanging by a thread after they lost by three goals to one to the Blades of Sheffield United at Bramall Lane. Negotiations between Galatasaray and AS Monaco for the extension of Henry Onyekuru's loan deal has failed to yield any positive results, thereby causing the Nigerian forward to miss training. Onyekuru moved to Turkey in the January transfer window and loaned for the rest of the season, which was halted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Nine more NBA players tested positive for the coronavirus ahead of the season restart in Orlando, Florida. The nine positive tests found between June the 24th to the 29th brings the overall total to 25 players out of a pool of 351 who have been tested since June the 23rd. I'm Ayotunde Balogun. That's wrap in Sports News. And the main news again, the Ondo State Commissioner for Health died today of COVID-19 related causes as more state officials are suspected to have tested positive for coronavirus, including the governor's wife. Also today, the All Progressives Congress National Caretaker Committee met with the national leader of the party, Ashwaj Bola Tinubu, a while ago behind closed doors. At the end of the meeting, Mr. Tinubu said it was a consultation on how to move the party forward. And that's it on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Alumidia McCauley. Do have a good night and please stay safe.